Thank you. The next item of business is a debate on motion 8870 in the name of Shirley Ann Somerville on Charities, Regulation and Administration, Scotland Bill at Stage 1. I would ask those members who would wish to speak in the debate to please press the request to speak buttons and I call on Shirley Ann Somerville, Cabinet Secretary, to speak to and to move the motion. Around nine minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer, and I move the motion in my name. I'm pleased to open this debate on the general principles of the Charities Regulation Administration Scotland Bill. This bill was delayed due to the pandemic, so I'm glad we are now able to progress it here today. Let me start by thanking the Social Justice and Social Security Committee for their thoughtful consideration of the bill and their Stage 1 report, which expresses support for the bill's general principles. I also want to thank all the stakeholders who have taken the time to express their views through oral and written evidence, both to the committee and through discussions with my officials. I'm also grateful to Oscar, the Scottish Charity Regulator, for its valuable contributions on this bill. As I'm sure everyone in this chamber will agree, charities are a crucial part of our society and of our communities, and it is therefore imperative that we have the right regulatory framework in place to ensure we can continue to support our charity sector and maintain public trust in how charities operate. The COVID-19 pandemic brought into sharp relief the importance of charities right across Scotland and the vital services they provide on the ground. Charities are widely supported by the public. Trust in them and what they deliver is high, and we want to keep it that way. And the Charities Trustee Investment Scotland Act 2005 is now over 17 years old, and the charity sector has changed significantly in that time. That's why we're aiming to strengthen and improve charity regulation through updating the 2005 Act. I'm pleased that charities have voiced their support for this bill and its principles, which will increase transparency of charities and proportionately extend Oscar's powers. It is encouraging to see that the committee supports all provisions within the bill, particularly information about charity trustees and charity accounts, both of which will increase transparency and will in turn strengthen and enhance public trust and confidence in the Scottish charity sector. The Stage 1 report sets out positive conclusions and constructive recommendations that my officials can take forward. Turning to the specifics of the Bill, the overall aim is to strengthen and update the existing framework rather than to revisit the fundamental principles of the 2005 Act. The bill is built around proposals put forward by Oscar based on its operational experience since the 2005 Act came into force. Further to this, following engagement with Oscar and the Law Society of Scotland, the record of charity mergers at Section 12 is proposed, which will improve access to legacy income for many charities, and a list of minor or technical amendments were also added. The Scottish Government consulted in 2019 and 2021 on the proposals put forward by Oscar, with over 400 written responses in total. Both consultations showed strong support for the proposals and that stakeholders are keen to see changes brought forward. The Bill covers a range of different provisions designed to enhance the existing framework. Each of the provisions falls under one of the three primary aims. The first is increasing transparency and accountability in charities by improving public access to information about the charity's operations. <clears throat> the Bill requires Oscar to publish the accounts for all charities and to include the name of charity trustees on the Scottish Charity Register. Oscar will be able to maintain a schedule of charity trustee details for its own internal use and provide a publicly searchable record of the small number of individuals who have been removed from holding trustee office by the courts. The Stage 1 report recognises the balance the Bill provides between the overarching need for transparency and the safeguarding of individual safety and security. The second aim is providing stronger powers for Oscar, including the power to issue positive directions to help charities address regulatory issues. Certainly. Gordon MacDonald. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for giving way, and for the record, I am supportive of the general principles of this bill. We all want to see good regulation, improved openness, accountability and transparency for our charities. We also need to ensure that those charities are well served by the regulator, Oscar. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, who regulates the regulator? And if a charity feels they have not been treated fairly or been communicated well with, who can they go to for adjudication during the process of interacting with Oscar? Cabinet Secretary. 
Well, the member raises uh, a very important uh, point. Clearly, um, there is the complaints procedure um, within OSCAR, um, and of course, if the individual or charity remains dissatisfied, um, there can obviously be um, further moves to the Scottish Public Services Ombudsman. Uh, but if there is a concern about um, the role of the regulator in this, I think this is one of the aspects uh, that can, um, if uh, people desire for that to be looked at in the wider reform work that will come forward um, on charity law. Uh, if I can move on, presiding officer, to that second aim about stronger powers uh, for Oscar. The bill gives Oscar a new power to issue positive directions to charities in addition to the existing powers to issue preventative directions. It also allows Oscar to conduct inquiries where necessary into former charities and their trustees. Oscar's powers and duties are enhanced by enabling Oscar to remove a charity from the register where it fails to provide accounts and fails to respond to communications. There is also a new provision which requires Oscar to refuse to enter an applicant onto the register where it considered it would not be appropriate to regulate the applicant because it has no connection or only a negligible connection to Scotland. Oscar is also empowered to appoint interim trustees to a charity in certain circumstances, for example, where the charity has no trustees or the existing trustees cannot be found. Furthermore, the Bill makes some adjustments to Oscar's processes around gathering information in connection, with, uh, in connection with inquiries in order to make them more streamlined and efficient. I'm grateful to the Committee for its support of these new powers and for the questions it has posed around the practicalities of the appointment of interim trustees. I understand the Committee's desire for more information on how Oscar envisaged that new power will work, especially in the light of difficulties faced by many charities on the recruitment and the retention of trustees themselves. Now, I understand that Oscar intends to write directly to the Committee on this point and on other areas requested in the Stage 1 report, including plans for communicating the changes with charities and providing guidance. Now, the third aim is to bring Scottish charity law up to date with some key aspects of charity regulation in England, Wales and Northern Ireland, enhancing public trust in charities and further protecting charitable assets. This will be achieved through updates to the criteria applying to the disqualification of charity trustees and the extension of disqualification to individuals employed in charities who exercise specified senior management functions. I'm glad that the committee agreed that it is sensible for Scotland to align the trustee disqualification criteria with the rest of the UK to enhance the sector's ability to carry out due diligence. I also appreciate the committee raising the important issue of trustee and senior management diversity within the charity sector. And I share the committee's view that those with lived experience can and should be, bring valuable and often unique contributions to charity boards. The bill enhances protection for charitable assets through the creation of a record of charity mergers and a new provision redirecting legacies where a charity has merged. The Stage 1 report asks the Scottish Government to consider whether other types of gifts to charities can be included in the record of charity mergers, and the Government is assessing this possibility. Um, one aspect of this, which I don't think we've necessarily had clarity on at Stage 1 of this bill, was with regards to lifetime gifts when a charity does go through a merger and just wondered what work government were doing ahead of stage two to prevent uh, to provide that clarity cabinet secretary well th this is indeed what the, the type of work that i referred to just um, in, in my um, remarks um, i made before the intervention um, i'm very keen uh, to, to look at this and very happy to work with members of the committee and indeed other members across the chamber to see what more can be done in advance of stage two and happy to take that forward with mr biggs should he uh, wish to do so this bill makes practical improvements and updates existing charity regulation and the role of Oscar. And that's why we've consulted pre-pandemic and why we're taking this forward. And I know that stakeholders want to see long-term changes to charity regulation. I want to be clear that this is not the purpose of this bill. This bill is intended to sustain the effective and supported regulation of charities during these challenging times. However, as I mentioned um, in my response um, to Gordon MacDonald, I do believe there is a need for a broader review of the future of charity regulation, which is why I am pleased to recommit to a wider review following the passage of this bill. 
The Stage 1 report helpfully sets out stakeholders' views on areas for consideration as part of that wider review, and we will ensure that we will engage with the charity sector further on the scope of that review and how it could be shaped. Presiding officer, this is a technical bill. It's a very focused bill that provides improvement for the charity sector by strengthening and enhancing the existing regulatory framework. I hope, therefore, that the Parliament will agree, and I hereby move the motion in my name. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I now call on Colette Stevenson to speak on behalf of the Social Justice and Social Security Committee. A generous eight minutes, Ms Stevenson. Thank you, presiding officer. I am delighted to be speaking on behalf of the Social Justice and Social Security Committee as its new convener. Before I get into the substance of the committee's scrutiny work, I would first like to thank the outgoing convener and deputy convener Natalie Dawn and Emma Roddick, as well as the wider committee for their diligent scrutiny of the charity's Regulation and Administration Scotland Bill. I know although the bill is small in size, it belies the technical complexities the committee had to grapple with. This bill aims to update and strengthen the 2005 Charities and Trustee Investment Scotland Act and provides an opportunity to improve the regulation of charities as well as to reinforce public confidence in the sector as a whole. As Chaz told us, charities are in a privileged position with regard to handling donations from the public. Those are things in relation to which public accountability is important. The committee saw a breadth of views, including from the third sector, designated religious charities, as well as from law, accountancy and audit professionals. The committee is extremely grateful to all of those who engaged with us. One of the objectives of the Bill is to bring Scottish charity legislation up to date with key aspects of regulation in England, Wales and Northern Ireland. Technical changes the Bill brings about will help regulation in Scotland keep pace with that of other jurisdictions. However, evidence gathered demonstrates a, da a desire to go further. For a wider review of charity law, and we understand that the Scottish Government has provided such a commitment, and we welcome this. It has been almost two decades since the 2005 legislation was enacted, and the use of digital systems means the world and the way we work has changed significantly. Witnesses made clear it is essential that any review is independent and crucially carried out in consultation with a wide range of people and organisations. We advocate strongly that the Scottish Government engages the third sector directly and early and makes specific efforts to reach those small to medium organisations. As part of its evidence, the Charity Law Association explained, one of the joys of the Scottish charity system is that we have sometimes been slightly ahead of the game, but now we are slightly behind the curve. We hope that wider review helps to put Scotland back at the forefront. Before turning to the detail of the provisions, I want to emphasise that although the committee supports the general principles, we did receive a clear message from the charitable sector that more information is required. The Scottish Government and Oscar must work together to ensure the sector is provided with this reassurance and support. One example of an area in need of clarification relates to the disqualification of potential trustees. It quickly became clear there was significant confusion surrounding undischarged bankruptcy as a disqualification criterion. Several witnesses were specifically concerned that some individuals with relevant lived experience may be barred from becoming a trustee even more so because the cost of living crisis could increase instances of bankruptcy. Although Oscar advised personal bankruptcy is an existing criterion for disqualification in place since the 2005 Act, we felt the regulator needed to clarify the position to the sector. It is concerning to the committee that it has not taken the introduction of this bill for the lack of awareness regarding this regulation to come to light. 
Now new legislation is coming through, Oscar must ensure that all existing and new regulations governing charities are well understood by those that work in them. Full transparency and accountability in the sector can only be achieved if individuals working in it know what is expected of them. While those potentially subject to disqualification can apply for a waiver, uncertainty around how the waiver process would work was also raised. A particular concern was default disqualification. It was thought that as well as the waiver process being potentially off-putting to prospective trustees, it could disproportionately affect those from marginalised backgrounds. Charities deal with public money raised in good faith. It is imperative that this element of the legislation remains robust. However, organisations and potential trustees must have the information and support that they need to ensure the waiver process is straightforward and individuals are given the opportunity to be judged fairly. The Scottish Government and OSCAR should ensure the process is well understood and that any associated administration is straightforward. Yes, happy to continue. John Mason. Yeah, I thank the member very much for giving way. I wasn't on the committee, but I was interested to read the report. And I think this issue was raised with the Cabinet Secretary. And one of her answers was that it, it, most of these bars are time limited. I, I just wondered if the committee was satisfied with that answer. Colette Stevenson. Um, uh, thank the member for that intervention. Um, that is something that we could bring forward um, at stage two. Um, I believe it's a 12 month period at the moment. Thank you. So charities deal with public money raised in good faith. And again, sorry, kind of go back. The appointment, sorry, of interim trustees by Oscar also prompted questions. So while the bill provides the regulator with the power to do this, evidence highlighted challenges in trustees' recruitment. We consider it may not be easy for Oscar to find and appoint individuals willing to act on a temporary basis. Our report seeks further information on how Oscar ex expects to be able to recruit interim trustees and how often it anticipates this power being used. We would like to know, for example, if there would be a Scotland-wide panel of trustees to draw from. The final provision I wish, to, I wish to discuss today relates to Oscar's ability to issue positive direction to charities following inquiries where concerns have been raised. While this was broadly supported, our evidence showed the sector needs greater clarity about how this will work in actual practice. For example, there was a spectrum of opinion regarding exemptions from positive directions for designated religious charities. The committee recommends the Scottish Government covers this issue as part of the wider review. It was clear throughout our scrutiny charities need more information about what will be expected of them, particularly on potential administrative and financial burdens. It is vitally important that, the, that any uncertainty is addressed. This is why we asked the Scottish Government to set out its plans for commencement of the Bill in advance of any Stage 2 consideration to provide assurances the expected time frame will allow enough time for communication with organisations to help them prepare. The committee is pleased the Scottish Government has since confirmed the expected time frame in writing and we thank the Cabinet Secretary for this. We also welcome the Scottish Government's recognition of the importance of communication with the sector. In conclusion, presiding officer, in order for charities to continue to add value, we must ensure they are probably, properly regulated and supported. So while the committee is pleased that a wider review is forthcoming, we recognise the need for the Charities Regulation and Administration Scotland Bill to update important regulatory elements of existing legislation now. The committee therefore supports the general principles of this bill and commends them to the Scottish Parliament. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Stevenson. I now call on Jeremy Balfour, a generous seven minutes, Mr Balfour. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. And can I uh, welcome this bill and uh, confirm that 
uh, those of us on this side of the chamber will be voting for it uh, later today. Uh, I think, as the Cabinet Secretary mentioned, this is a fairly non-controversial bill, and uh, that's probably just as well, because uh, since stage one, we've had a new Cabinet Secretary, we've had a new convener, new Deputy Convener, and lost five members of the committee. So if it had been controversial, heaven knows what would have happened. However, it is uh, a welcome bill, and um, I do hope that it will bring some clarity in regard to how charity law is developing. Um, like others, I would like to thank those who gave evidence to the committee um, at stage one, uh, to the third sector, to other uh, bodies interested in this. And like the Cabinet Secretary, we all acknowledge, I'm sure with this, within the Chamber, the importance of the third sector of charities uh, within Scotland. Within our local communities, many of us see charities uh, providing uh, care and help uh, to the most vulnerable, and many of us are aware of the larger charities that work across Scotland. As someone who worked briefly in the third sector, and as someone who has uh, been a trustee of a number of charities, um, I know uh, sometimes the difficulty it is to be able to recruit people into these positions to make sure that there is good governance. And I do hope that this uh, bill or act in due course will help in regard to that. Um, I suppose what is most disappointing, if one can be critique it slightly, is not what's in the bill, but what's not in the bill. Um, and that was the clear evidence that came forward from particularly the third sector um, on the evidence that we heard. Uh, this was an opportunity, perhaps, to have a, a fairly wide-ranging review of charity law, rather than the technical bill that we have before us today. But uh, that has not happened. And I think there is disappointment in regard to that. Now, I do understand that the Minister has um, said again today that there will be further consultation once this becomes an act. But I wonder if she could just uh, put on record uh, as she closes that there will be no bill this, within this Parliament. So any change within charity law uh, would happen in the next session. Uh, grateful to, to the member just to, to clarify, uh, there is no intention for a further um, bill, so a piece of primary legislation isn't possible, but of course there are a number, perhaps of pieces of secondary legislation that could be changed, and that's something I'm happy to look at in the scope of the wider review. Chairman Balfour. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that clarification. Um, as uh, our new convener um, has mentioned, and I do welcome her to the role, um, I think one of the things that came out again in the evidence was perhaps the clarification that the third sector needs on actually how charity law works. There did seem to be quite a lot of misunderstanding or concern which was there, which um, needs to be clarified. Um, I think there are some of the, how this will work in practice also needs to be clarified, uh, and I welcome um, the letter that we have already received from the Cabinet Secretary, and I look forward to receiving the correspondence uh, from Oscar. Um, I would just point out gently, both to Oscar and to the Scottish Government, that we are working on quite a tight timescale in regard to Stage 2 amendments. My understanding that they will happen early next month, which means we will have to be lodged this month, um, and we're already nearly halfway through this month. So I do hope that we will receive early correspondence um, from these bodies so that the appropriate discussions and amendments can be brought forward which will seek to improve the bill. Um, I wonder in the time I just left with, uh, with me, um, Deputy President, if I can just pick up on three areas of the bill that I think we maybe need to have a look at in a wee bit more, more depth. The first is in regard to sections four and seven um, of the bill and Ali's disqualification from being a trustee. Again, this was an area that there seems to be a, a wee bit of lack of understanding of what it actually means in practice. And I do hope that Oscar will seek to clarify that as soon as possible. I think also, interestingly, the, the Law Society um, of Scotland pick up that how the regulations that will follow on from any act will be vitally important of actually how this works in practice. And again, I, I'm sure the Scottish Government will 
but I would seek a reassurance that there will be a full consultation on these regulations with the third sector before they are brought forward to Parliament to approve. The other area that perhaps we just need to look at is around protected trustees, which some individuals use um, when they um, are facing uh, bankruptcy. I understand that if you're declared bankrupt, that would only last for one calendar year. But for protected trustees, I think there's a longer period, and thus we may see um, some people being disbarred from being a trustee for that longer period of time. And one of the things that became very clear again in the evidence is that we do need a wider group of individuals to become trustees. Uh, we need to see a, a wider range from other parts of society that perhaps haven't done this in the past. And disqualification may put people off in regard to that. Uh, the second area, just to probe a little round, is around section 8 of the bill and that is in regard to interim trustees. Um, I suppose the question is where will we come from? Um, certainly the charities I speak to here within Lothian um, are desperate for people to become trustees. So again, is this, and again maybe some clarification on this, will this be a panel of individuals that the Scottish Government set up or Oscar set up that they can call upon? Um, uh, with pleasure. John Mason. Uh, I thank the member for giving way. I just wonder if he thinks that actually maybe for some people they, they couldn't commit to a long term with a charity, but they might be willing to do you know, a few months to help out. Jeremy Balfour. Well, I, I, mean, I think that's an interesting concept. Um, I would quite like to see it tested to see if that is right, but it certainly may well be something that we can look at. Um, and I think also in regard to um, how these individuals uh, relate I think there was slight confusion, and perhaps it's my ignorance rather than anyone else's, in regard to what happens if a charity has an interim trustee appointed that they don't want. Uh, my reading of the bill is that there's no right of appeal in regard to that, and the only way forward would be for those trustees who maybe haven't been functioning but are still around to take a judicial review. Now, that would seem to me very expensive, um, and take up a lot of resources and time. And I'm just wondering uh, whether the government could uh, write to the committee to try to clarify why there is no right of appeal if you don't like the interim trustees that have been appointed. I think this will be done on a fairly rare occasion, but when it does, it's probably because there's been some kind of conflict or something has gone wrong. Uh, the final area, and very briefly, Deputy President, is to pick up a point and maybe my colleague Miles Briggs in regard to lifetime gifts and legacies, section 12 of the bill. Um, again, reading the Law Society of Scotland's submission, that if there's a lifetime gift, so if I put a, a, a lifetime gift in my will and that charity merges with another charity, it would be for me, who has uh, written the will, to have my will altered. And if that didn't happen, the money wouldn't go to the new merged charity. Uh, that seems to put quite a lot of onus on people to keep up to date of what's happening in charity law. And I do think, and I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's remarks that she is going to look at this, but I do think we just need to get this a bit cleaner and a bit tighter in regard to stage two and stage three. Uh, with those comments, I, I close by saying thank you. We're welcoming again the um, bill before us, and I look forward to improving it over stage two and stage three. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Balfour. And I now call on Paul O'Kane, a generous six minutes, please, Mr O'Kane. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I'm pleased to be leading this debate on behalf of the Scottish Labour Party. And at the outset, can I refer members to my register of interests, as I currently serve as the Chair of Trustees of Neilston War Memorial Association. Uh, I'd like to take this opportunity um, to thank the Social Justice and Social Security Committee for their hard work in scrutinising this bill and indeed pay tribute to all the predecessor members. I think as Jeremy Balfour rightly recognised that there are many newbies, if you like, uh, participating in this debate who have inherited uh, this important piece of work but nonetheless are very keen to make our contribution as the bill moves through its uh, stages. And indeed, uh, Pam Duncan Glancy, uh, former member of the committee, who I know worked very hard on this bill as it passed uh, through committee uh, in the stage one uh, report process. Uh, 
Uh, from the outset, I want to be clear in stating that Scottish Labour does support the Bill and believes it is critically important that charities operate with transparency and accountability. And we recognise that the Bill will update Scottish charity uh, legislation, aligning it with key tenets of regulations that govern charities in England, Wales and Northern Ireland. But I think in common with um, what we've heard um, from uh, other opening speeches, I think it is evident that some of uh, the aspects of the Bill uh, should be refined and clarified as the Bill moves into Stage 2 and Stage 3. Uh, and indeed looking particularly at how the new regulations will impact and interact with uh, different charities uh, in different ways. Uh, for example, I think it's critically important that we don't uh, overburden charities um, with regulation to such a degree that it stifles their ability uh, and limits their resources uh, to perform their primary function of delivering support for the causes that they champion and for uh, the causes that are supported widely uh, by the public in a variety of ways. Uh, in terms of regulation, I think it is important that at stage two there is greater focus perhaps placed on exploring the remit and resources of OSCAR, uh, the independent regular, uh, regulator and registrar of Scotland's charities, to ensure there is proportionate increases of required in funding to allow OSCAR to carry out its responsibilities effectively. And I appreciate we've already had at the beginning of a discussion about that wider piece of work that requires to be done uh, reviewing the, the charity sector in Scotland uh, and indeed the support uh, therein. Because I think it's clear that the wider context uh, is important and I have already in this chamber highlighted the significant financial pressures that are facing third sector uh, organisations across Scotland. Because we know that the reality is that the majority of charities are small local organisations um, with less than 10% of registered charities in Scotland having more than 20 employees. And very often these organisations are firmly rooted in their community. Uh, and relying on the tireless generosity and passion of volunteers to deliver vital support for those who need it. Indeed, I mentioned last week uh, in the Chamber during my contribution to the, the debate on social isolation and loneliness that uh, in the context of the cost of living crisis, third sector organisations are being asked to deliver more with less resource. So we do, I think, need to recognise that whilst this is a technical bill, um, there is a wider debate here about the third sector uh, as a vital national resource. Um, their expertise is unrivalled and the work that they do is invaluable. And I think government, um, in, as part of that wider review, will want to consider uh, the continuing conversation about funding, uh, long-term funding, uh, looking to move beyond uh, that one year-to-year -year funding of uh, the third sector and looking at the availability of more core funding uh, and indeed supporting uh, representative bodies like the Scottish Council for Voluntary Organisations to actually drive forward a lot of these changes uh, and support um, charities, I think, to grow their capacity actually uh, to be able to uh, seamlessly move through uh, with these changes. Our third sector needs greater stability, I think, rather than being limited by continuous cycles of short-term funding uh, and uh, different interventions at different stages in terms of regulation. Indeed, during the consultation process for the bill, several third sector organisations actually highlighted that they were struggling to respond to the consultation simply because they didn't have capacity to draft a meaningful response within the timescale. So I think that in itself tells us a story about the picture uh, for many charities. Indeed, uh, only a tiny fraction of the 25,000 registered charities in Scotland submitted a response to the consultation. And indeed, throughout those responses, I think we saw um, questions raised, uh, which we've already heard articulated, uh, about the impact of the legislation, particularly around perhaps the creation of a register of trustees, um, it has been highlighted by many charities and indeed by the Faculty of Advocates that charities already struggle to recruit charity trustees with the requisite skills, passion and experience and indeed the time commitment to give to the charities. And I think although um, we see in the bill that uh, trustees, prospective trustees will be able to apply to OSCAR to preserve their anonymity, um, I think that whilst protecting accountability and transparencies of charities, it is actually important to recognise that for many people that creates additional barriers to actually becoming a trustee and engaging, particularly for people who perhaps are going through a period of re rehabilitation, rebuilding their lives perhaps after criminal convictions or, or a prison sentence. And I do think we have to be mindful of the balance between protecting charities and protecting the money people do donate to charities, but also give everyone a fair crack of the whip and an opportunity. To, uh, yes, certainly. John Reason. Yeah, I thank the member much for giving way. 
would you accept that from the point of view of trusting a charity, if I'm a potential donor or I just want to find out about a charity, it's a bit strange when you look at the report and there's no names and no trustees whatsoever? Paul O'Kane. I, 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 absolutely. I mean, I, I do take John Mason's point. I, I do think we have to uh, find uh, ways to share that information appropriately. But I think, that, that, of course, what the point I'm making here is the danger is we don't want to create too high a barrier for people who are going through that process of um, trying to improve and better their lives um, after a variety of situations. And I think we do need to strike the balance because I think people want to have confidence. They want to know who is in uh, control of the charity, who is, uh, is governing the charity. But I do think we just need to be quite careful about how we, how we go about that and what the thresholds are for when someone can, can remain anonymous. So um, I, I will, presiding officer, draw these remarks to a close. Um, I want to reiterate Scottish Labour's support for the bill. Uh, we want to call on the government to adopt an open, positive approach and work with all parties uh, to strengthen the bill, to iron out perhaps some of the concerns that have been raised by charities. Uh, and moreover, I would urge the Cabinet Secretary to engage further with charities on that piece of work that she has committed to, um, really to ensure that the bill carries the confidence of the sector and that more widely we can have a conversation Conversation about how we strengthen and support charities across Scotland. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kane. And we will now move to the open debate. I would advise members that there is quite a bit of time in hand. Should members be inclined to seek or take or make interventions, or perhaps expand on their original uh, thoughts on the matter? And I call on Gordon Macdonald to be followed by Douglas Lumsden. Mr. Macdonald. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I'll not continue speaking this slowly. Uh, I, should <laughs> I should highlight that I'm one of the relatively new members of the committee that uh, Jeremy Balfour referred to earlier, but I'll also take this opportunity to commend the clerks and previous members of the committee who led on this piece of work and, of course, the stakeholders who provided invaluable evidence. The bill itself, introduced in uh, November 22, has undergone two consultations that attracted over 400 written responses and aims to strengthen and update the current legislative framework for charities. It will do this by increasing transparency, for example, with the creation of a register of trustees and additional powers to the Office of the Scottish Charity Regulator, which includes being able to investigate charities and charity trustees. I support the general principles of the bill, which I believe will ensure robust regulation as well as as improved openness, accountability and transparency for our charities. The charitable sector provides important and in some cases essential support across communities and to individuals, from local scout groups to training providers to play groups. The reach is far and varied, with every community in Scotland having at least one of the 25,000 charities operating in Scotland. In my constituency of Edinburgh Pentlands, there are 263 registered charities who many people in my area depend on for support. However, one in eight of those same charities fail to submit their annual return and are currently flagged as defaulting. Therefore, it is right that we look again at the legislation passed in 2005 to ensure it is fit for purpose. Submissions to the consultation recognise that the charity sector has changed and grown significantly since 2005, with many citing the expectation from the public on charities having changed. In particular, organisations funded by local and national government agencies are subject to more checks and balances than ever before. A common theme among respondents was a need for greater transparency and accountability to maintain the public's trust in the sector. The pandemic had a profound impact on the sector, and I'm certain members across the Chamber will all be too aware of the pressure on them throughout that time. Some of the respondents believe this situation underlined the need for greater transparency, as well as the need for wider reform, given the huge changes that happened in response to the challenges posed by the pandemic. Evidence submitted also highlighted a belief that the past three years following COVID-19 has seen more change in the sector than ever before since the 2005 Act was implemented. In addition, the consultation process, which focused on potential improvements to the statutory charity regulation framework, there were calls for a more fundamental review of the charitable sector, and I am pleased that the Cabinet Secretary indicated her intention to consult further with the sector on this following the passage of this bill. 
In terms of the provisions set out in the Bill in general, they reflect and, I believe, strengthen the proposals put forward by Oscar back in 2018. And as I already indicated, the Bill proposes giving Oscar wider po powers to investigate charities and charity trustees, amending the rules on who can be a charity trustee or a senior officer in a charity, increasing the information that Oscar holds about charity trustees, updating the information which needs to be included on the Scottish Charity Register, and creating a record of charities that have merged. It is clear from the majority of charitable organisations who responded that the proposed changes to the legislation is a welcome move by the Scottish Government. Overall, the evidence gathered agreed that the Bill would lead to greater transparency in charity regulation. There were some concerns raised that the proposal would only be effective in increasing transparency and protecting the Scottish public if Oscar is appropriately resourced and able to implement its new powers. I'm pleased that the Cabinet Secretary has taken this into consideration and given assurances that the additional obligations, while significant, will not be too burdensome and will work with Oscar to ensure they are supported. Of those that responded, many recognised that increasing Oscar's powers to investigate current and former charities, as well as broader coverage of the right to disqualify trustees, will have a positive impact on protecting the public. In addition, many respondents believe that strengthening Oscar's powers will act as a deterrent against maladministration, which will go some way in offering assurances to the general public about management of funds. A number of respondents supported the creation of a publicly searchable record of trustees, which they believed would increase transparency and protect the public against rogue trustees, who previously would be able to avoid scrutiny. Many smaller charities, understandably, have concerns on whether or not any changes to the legislation would result in additional costs to them, particularly when we are still in the throes of a cost of living increase, which undoubtedly has had a huge significant impact on their ability to operate. I welcome the assurances from the Scottish Government as set out the financial memorandum that whilst the changes may result in some additional administrative time, there should not be any additional costs. Finally, Presiding Officer, I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's earlier commitment to review the regulation of OSCAR and any future wider review of charitable law following the passage of this Bill. This is fundamental and will go some way to ensure that charitable organisations are treated fairly in any dispute. Thank you, Mr MacDonald. And I call Douglas Lumsden to be followed by Marie McNair. Uh, our generous six minutes, Mr <laughs> uh, Thank you, President Officer. And I want to start by extending my thanks to the members and clerks of the committee for producing this report that is not only helpful but clearly shows the views of our third sector throughout its findings and recommendations. Uh, President Officer, I think we all agree that our third sector is the lifeblood of so many of our communities. They provide on-the-ground service that governments struggle to provide. They meet the needs of residents that large-scale organisations have difficulties in tackling. Whether that is befriending programmes for the lonely, rehabilitations for those affected by addiction, or warm hubs for those who are struggling with household bills, these small-scale local actions by our voluntary organisations are central to the well-being and community cohesion throughout Scotland. I want to take this opportunity to thank the incredible charities of the North East, too many to name, but if I could just highlight Camp Hill School Aberdeen, Big Noise Torrey and the Men's Shed Network. Three fantastic charities working with young people and adults in the North East who provide a vital service and resource in our community. They deserve our thanks and our support, President Officer. But reform of uh, charity legislation is long overdue, and I join with colleagues in welcoming this bill that we are considering today. It goes some way to developing a clearer framework for charities and their trustees in Scotland, encouraging the use of technology and building greater transparency into the system so that our third sector has greater accountability and access to support and help. I also welcome the consultation that took place with the third sector when drafting this legislation. It has been well thought through and the third sector has engaged widely. Although I note that only 12 of the 32 third sector interfaces responded to the consultation, 
but I do recognise that this was during the pandemic when many organisations had to place resources elsewhere. I support the committee's recommendation that the Scottish Government looks again at how it engages the third sector in the future and would ask that the Cabinet Secretary if they could bring forward a plan of how that may happen for future consultations. I note that many of the organisations who responded to the cons consultation did have concerns about the place of people with lived experiences as trustees under the new legislation and welcome the committee's focus on this in their report. They clearly thought carefully about this issue and considered the implications on boards and recruiting trustees. The committee calls for much greater clarity on the disqualif disqualification criteria around bankruptcy and to ensure that the waiver process is well understood by the sector. This will clearly require some work by Oscar to ensure that this is placed once the legislation has been passed here. And we heard that from the convener already. Presiding officer, as anyone involved in charities in Scotland knows, recruitment of trustees is challenging. Finding the right people to do the right job is difficult. And this has been particularly highlighted in more rural communities. It is important that this legislation does not dissuade anyone who is suitable from becoming a charity trustee and does not make the process cumbersome and therefore putting people off. More clarity is also needed around the interim trustee process and you know, what that will mean in practice. And I look forward to the committee considering this during the passage of the bill. There is clearly a great deal of concern among charities who responded to the consultation about the level of additional administrative burden that this will place on small charities. As we know, the majority of charities are small and most are wholly staffed by volunteers. It is vital that any additional administra administrative responsibilities does not negatively impact on their ability to deliver services within our communities. In the report, Alzheimer's Scotland makes an important point around the administrative and financial burden. Additional burdens should not put off any volunteer treasurers or administrators for the charities as well. This is a key concern that needs to be addressed moving forward with clear guidance from the government and OSCAR and IT solutions put in place that makes it easier for charities to report rather than harder. Although not included in this particular bill, I think it's also worth highlighting the section in Annex A of the report around the auditing threshold for charities. I understand that the level of income for charities in Scotland is slightly smaller, but I would ask the Cabinet Secretary again to listen to the calls from the third sector on this issue. I note one comment from the consultation held on the 1st of March from the summary note that states anecdotally there is a lack of availability of auditors which I'm sure members of the SNP front bench would agree with and have some experience of recently. Finally, President Officer, I support the principles of the bill and welcome this reform of the charity legislation. More clarity is needed on some areas, and I would echo the views of the third sector and their calls for, for clearer guidance in certain areas. And I'm genuinely pleased to see that the Scottish Government have listened to the concerns of the sector and have worked with them to develop this legislation. I hope this can be a model for future legislation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Lumsden. I now call Marie McNair to be followed by Faisal Chowdhury uh, around six minutes or so. Thank you, President Officer. Charities play a vital role in supporting all our communities, particularly those who are in greatest need. The pandemic and cost of living crisis has continued to highlight just how vital the support charities provide truly is. And I see this firsthand with the terrific charities in my Clybank and Mogai constituency. I put on record my thanks to all the hardworking charities who support those in need and work to improve our communities. This bill is an important step we must take to strengthen the third sector in Scotland. It has been 17 years since legislation concerning charity law in Scotland was passed. And it's important we have listened to charities who have been calling for the Scottish Government to update and strengthen current regulations. It is right that as a starting point for updating this legislation, the Bill is centred on the practical proposals put forward by the Office of the Scottish Charity Regulator. 
Scotland's charities raise over £14 billion each year, so it is essential they are properly regulated. Charities can't exist without the support of generous donors, and we know that these donors are more likely to support charities when they are confident that those in charge are the right people to ensure their money is being used responsibly. At the core of it, charity is about trust. When individuals become involved with the charity, they are giving more than just their time and money, and they deserve to know that those managing their donations and running the charity can be trusted to act in its best interest. This bill will ensure that the public can trust the charities most important to them by enhancing transparency and accountability across the sector. Oscar already does vital work overseeing the third sector in Scotland. They grant charitable status, they monitor compliance, they investigate misconduct and much, much more. But currently it is clear that they do not have the powers to fulfil their core aim of ensuring transparency. With the ability to issue positive directions, publish annual financial accounts for every charity, appoint interim trustees where required for a maximum of 12 months, and ensure individuals disqualified as trustees are known and unable to work in other senior management roles. This bill will ensure that Oscar has met the enforcement powers they need to meet their core aim of increasing transparency in the sector. Often charities are benefited from their trustees being those who have lived experience of a specific issue. So I am very conscious that there will be certain areas where due to their nature, such as victim support organisations, trustees must be afforded anonymity. Therefore, as was concluded by the Social Justice and Social Security Committee, I am glad that the provisions of the Bill strike a good balance between greater transparency while also providing avenues to protect the identity of trustees where necessary. What is most important about the proposals in this bill is that they in no way impact a charity's ability to support those in need. No decisions we make here will see any charity have, any, have to uh, sacrifice frontline resources. Over half of all charitable organisations in Scotland have an annual income of under 25,000. It would not take much additional regulatory burden to see the vital work these smaller charities do significantly hampered. With that in mind, I am pleased that the analysis conducted by the Scottish Government found that charities themselves are supportive of the proposals included in this bill and do not foresee any other than the minor costs, a finding that was also supported by the Citizens Advice Scotland. It is important we also acknowledge the views of the experts who consulted on this bill. The Law Society of Scotland stated these proposals are sensible and proportionate and that the register of trustees' names will directly increase transparency. The chair of Oscar believed this bill will increase public trust in Scotland's 25,000 charities. And Citizen Advice Scotland highlighted that this bill will help to improve public confidence in the third sector and ensure that the benefits charities provide society are therefore maximised. It is clear to me, therefore, that there is widespread support for these proposals from those who will be impacted the most. I believe this bill is an important step we must take to support the third sector. Charities will only continue to receive the donations that they urgently require if donors have full confidence that their donations are going to support those who need it most. The improvements this bill will make to transparency in the sector will go a long way to ensure donors continue to have confidence in the charities they choose to support. It is clear from the consultation that further work will be required as we continue to strengthen the Scottish charity sector. However, I am firmly supportive of this bill and believe it provides the best possible framework to begin comprehensively improving charity regulation in Scotland. Thank you. Thank you, Ms McMahon. I now call uh, Faisal Chowdhury to be followed by John Mason around six minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, before I begin, I would like to declare my interest as Chair of the Edinburgh and Lothian Regional Equality Council. Uh, the, ch the Charities Regulation and Administration Scotland Bill aims to update the current charity law in Scotland, and Scottish Labour welcome a much-needed update. As many of my colleagues have already mentioned, the bill will pass more power into the hands of the Scottish Charity Regula uh, Regulator, Oscar. It will, all, uh, it will hold charities more accountable uh, 
for the appointment of trustees and the publication of accounts. It also increases transparency and accountability in charities by increasing public access to information about the daily running of the charity. These are, of course, welcome improvement, but a more uh, in-depth review is still required. As part of my role on the Social Justice and Social Security Committee, I highlighted these issues and then the Cabinet Secretary, Shona Robinson, outlined that the implementation of this bill would help to guide a wider review of the charity sector in general. I hope, this, uh, I hope that this uh, continues to be the case. Of course, there are some key issues I would like to highlight with this bill. The first is the concern that the consultation and engagement process did not go far enough. Many thought the engagement process was not well advertised. Both Zero Tolerance Scotland and the Edinburgh Rape Crisis Centre were examples of the organisation who did not have the capacity to interact with the consultation process in 2019 and 2021. They have expressed the view that the latest and the final consultation process was not advertised well enough for them to participate. As well as this, smaller charities and organizations were not given a, a representative opportunity to uh, contribute to the call for views. I chair the Edinburgh and Lothian Regional Equality Council, and I can confirm uh, that LREC were not made aware of any opportunity to participate in such consultations. The Scottish Omen uh, Convention and the Children's Hospice Association Scotland also expressed express concern uh, about the publicity around the engagement events. They expressed that it was not wide-reaching enough and not all third sector organization had the opportunity to uh, express their concern and feedback. Some charities also felt that they have not had the chance to fully contribute to the bill and that the development has been skewed towards the views of the Oscar. I sincerely hope that the wider review of the charity sector that the Cabinet Secretary promised will seek to avoid this issue in the future. With regards to smaller third sector organisations, I have been made aware that there are some concerns about some of the provisions of the bill, specifically with regards to the provision on the publication of accounts and implementation of register of trustees. Of course, uh, we welcome the transparency and accountability that this will bring. But there is concern about if this will disproportionately uh, uh, affect smaller third sector organisations. Foundation Scotland expressed concern that the administrative burden placed on the charities due to the new provision may feel disproportionate for smaller charities. The Institute of uh, Chartered Accountants Scotland expressed that smaller charities and third sector organisations are also likely to feel daunted about the implementation of uh, a register of trustee. This is both in terms of complying with the requirements and securing uh, disclosure exemptions on grounds of safety and security. If this implementation of this bill does not look like a greater burden to smaller charities, one uh, that were largely left out of the consultation process, then I hope an adjustment period uh, can be introduced to assist the affected organization. But first and foremost, I hope that Scottish Government will be able to provide assurance going forward that this bill will not disproportionately affect smaller third sector organisations. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Mr. Chaudhry. I now call John Mason to be followed by Maggie Chapman. Around six minutes, uh, Mr. Mason. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to take part today. Uh, as members will know, I have not been a member of the committee, either previously or currently, uh, dealing with the bill, uh, so I have not been involved in taking evidence or preparing the report. However, perhaps that has some advantages in that I come to it with, without a lot of preconceived uh, notions. I might also say that I am currently a trustee of one charity, that is Fair Share Trust, but have been involved in a variety of ones over the years. Starting with what is actually in the bill, uh, whether or not trustees' names should be in the public domain has clearly been considered by the committee at some length, and it is argued it uh, will increase transparency and accountability. Although I do note that there has been some concern about this, including from the Faculty of Advocates. And I do fully accept that there needs to be some right of privacy. So I would agree that, for example, home addresses should not be shown. However, the right to privacy, it seems to me, surely has to have some limits and be balanced against other rights and public expectations. In preparation for today's debate, my staff and I were looking at the published reports and accounts of a few Glasgow charities. For example, one charity, which I have had some concerns about, I have to say, it had all the trustee names redacted. And apart from the fact that I think that looks very odd in comparison to, say, a business or housing association report, it does give myself or any member of the public a real problem. One of the reassurances a concerned person or a potential donor can have when looking at a charity is to see the names of the trustees and gaining reassurance that they are known to some extent and trustworthy. Becoming a charity trustee is not to be taken lightly and carries certain responsibilities with it. Therefore, I do very much believe that it is important that trustee names are published, except in very exceptional circumstances. Moving on to the issue of disqualifying trustees because of bankruptcy, pre presumably neither charities themselves nor potential donors nor the wider public want trustees to be managing charity finances if they cannot manage their own personal finances. At the same time, the point is correctly made that we do want people with lived experience who can bring practical reality to the way a charity operates. So once again, there is a balance to be struck. I thought the Cabinet Secretary, I assume the previous Cabinet Secretary's answer was helpful in that many of the disqualifications are time limited. If someone has made a mistake in the past or if they've got into financial trouble through no fault of their own, then they must be given the opportunity to turn their lives around and get another chance. But I think it does no harm to have a bit of breathing space in that process. Another point which is made is that someone can have a huge input to a charity without actually being a trustee. Being a trustee is a, responsible, a, a, is a responsibility, it is not a reward. And as Oscar says, public trust and confidence is very important. There are a range of other issues which I will just mention in passing. I note that the Cabinet Secretary made the point that she felt all trustees should be treated in the same way. But I do actually wonder if that is the case. A trustee for a charity with income of, say, £25,000 surely does not carry the same level of responsibility as the trustee for a charity with income of £25 million. On inter interim and temporary trustees, I do think that some people might be willing to take on such a role just because it was time-limited and they would not be making such a long-term commitment if they took on being a trustee in normal circumstances. And I would have to say that I personally might consider a, an interim role, whereas I wouldn't consider a, a long-term one. But that's not an invitation uh, for people to contact me. Uh, I have to say that one point I did not really understand was that information in the accounts could be used maliciously against the charities. And I was not really clear what the committee meant by that. A availability of auditors, or the lack of them, was raised by ICAS, of which I should say I am a member. Um, and I think with the, so many charities being under £25,000, it is worth considering if any checks are really needed on that at all, whereas independent examination is clearly an important alternative for medium-sized charities. But clearly, it seems to me, the risk of misappropriation increases with income. And I would have reservations if the threshold for an audit was raised from half a million pounds to one million pounds, as ICAST suggest. A lot can go wrong with an income of half a million pounds. And I think it is the risk factor which should be decisive in that question. 
Moving on to what is not in the Bill, I did say in my own brief submission to the consultation that I considered we need a more fundamental review of charity law. And I'm glad to see that a number of other organisations said the same, including the Law Society of Scotland. And Annex A in the committee's report touches on this. It seems to me that we have at least three different types of charities at the moment in Scotland, and they are all very different from each other. There is the small local charity, which is working in the local community or perhaps raising funds for a school overseas, and it is run entirely by volunteers. Then there are much larger charities who are also doing that same kind of work, but with a large number of staff and possibly government funding. And we think of charities like Oxfam, Barnardo's, SSPCA eh, in that category. And again, there are other big organisations like Glasgow Life, housing associations, universities and the like, which are probably not really charities in the traditional sense of the word. Now, I have no problem with any of these bodies getting tax breaks, as they do, which I think is one of the incentives for being a charity. And they do certainly fulfil charitable purposes. In Glasgow Life's case, I think they claim to fulfil seven of the purposes for, a, for being a charity. But I, I still wonder if we should really be calling something like Glasgow Life a charity. I think that is a bit misleading a, in the use of the word. And I feel it dilutes the, the positive feeling that many people have around charities. And maybe we need to look in the long term at new definitions of the word. But in closing, I'm very happy to support the Bill at Stage 1, and I hope the Bill will be followed by more wide-ranging legislation in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Mason. Uh, I now call Maggie Chapman, who joins us remotely, to be followed by Pam Duncan-Glancy. Around six minutes, Ms Chapman. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I am pleased to contribute to this debate today in support of the general principles of this bill on behalf of the Scottish Greens, and I refer members to my register of interests. I was previously employed in different roles within the charitable sector, and I am a member of some others. Charities, the third sector, play a vital role in our communities. They often support us at some of the most difficult or challenging times in our lives. They provide crucial, sometimes life-saving services for us as individuals, families and whole communities. They advocate on our behalf when we cannot or might not be able to speak for ourselves. They provide constructive challenge and critique for all levels of government on policy direction and, des and decisions. They build resilience and provide protections across all of our communities. Their hard work often going unseen and sadly often undervalued too. Our society would not function without these services and supports and the often selfless work that so many contribute to our collective well-being. It is therefore vital that the regulatory framework within which charities operate is up to date and serves both the charities and wider society as well as possible. As we've heard already this afternoon, charity law in Scotland has not been significantly amended since the Charities and Trustee Investment Scotland Act 2005 was enacted. The bill we debate today aims to update the current system of charity regulation by improving transparency and accountability, enhancing public trust by providing greater protection for charity assets and the charity brand through stronger enforcement powers, and improving the efficiency of OSCA's operations. If passed, as the Cabinet, Cabinet Secretary has outlined, this technical bill will make a number of amendments to that 2005 Act. It seeks to give OSCA, the charity regulator, wider powers to investigate charities and charity trustees. It amends the rules on who can be a trustee or a senior office holder in a charity, vital roles that must be properly supported. And it increases the information that OSCA holds about charity trustees. It also updates the information that is required to be included on the Scottish Charity Register and create a record of charities that have merged. Importantly, all of this seeks to make charities more accountable and transparent in their governance and operational arrangements. I am very grateful to the Social Justice and Social Security Committee for its detailed scrutiny of this bill over recent months and its Stage 1 report published last month. As someone who does not sit on that committee, I found this report very helpful to better understand the issues covered in this technical legislation. Others have already highlighted specific issues or areas of concern, but I just want to reinforce the calls made on the Scottish Government for early and direct engagement with the breadth of the charity sector, not only over the coming stages of this bill, but for any and all future views of charity law in Scotland. 
Similarly, we should all share the responsibility for the provision of clear information to ensure the sector as a whole is aware of the provisions in the spill and that there is shared understanding of the implications of the legislation for charities and regulators alike. This bill is clearly not intended to be a complete review or reform of charity law, but rather to enhance the measures that already exist. However, the various consultations that have led us to today particularly what the Social Justice and Social Security Committee heard, are clear. A more comprehensive review of the 2005 legislation is required, and I'm grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for her statements of intent around the wider reviews. Because, as others have said, there are things that this bill does not do, which we would like to see considered. Specifically, Greens would like to see charitable concessions for activities that are goods in and of themselves such as the generation of zero carbon energy, in the same way as poverty alleviation or supporting vulnerable people are seen as legitimate and laudable charitable purposes. Charities shouldn't have to go through the bureaucratic process of setting up trading subsidiaries just to do good. We would also like to see the explicit inclusion of each of the protected characteristics currently covered in the Equality Act into charity law. Religion is obviously already covered and rightly so but we consider there to be benefit to ensuring all protected characteristics are treated similarly in charity legislation. However, I appreciate these are substantial proposals and along with many of the other issues raised by other groups and organizations, some of which have already been highlighted this afternoon, these would all be better considered as part of that wider review already planned for future years. So in closing, Presiding Officer, I would like to thank all those charities, individuals and other agencies and groups who have contributed to the consultations and committee evidence sessions so far. This input is invaluable to our scrutiny of any legislation, but perhaps is especially important when dealing with such technical legislation about organisations and the sector that supports so much of our lives. I know there is still work to do, and I look forward to following the progress of this bill through the forthcoming stages. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms Chapman. Uh, and I call Pam Duncan Glancy to be followed by Fergus Ewing. Around six minutes, Ms Duncan Glancy. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. Charities and third sector organisations work tirelessly to deliver for communities right across Scotland. They deliver services, develop policies, provide volunteering and paid work, contributing hugely to the economy, and even provide food, shelter and financial support direct to people in all of our constituencies. Without them, many people across Scotland and in the Glasgow region would be left isolated in poverty, alone and without the essential care and support that they need. And so I'd like to put on record just now my thanks to all the third sector organisations and the people working in them up and down our country today. That's why I and my party welcome this bill, which aims to bring regulation in the sector up to date and in line with other areas of the UK. For the most part, it does so. But I want to use my contribution today to highlight some areas where we need the government to be a bit clearer and to act, and I want to reinforce the, re the importance of supporting and resourcing the third sector organisations to make sure that they're not left to implement changes on their own. One of the key areas, I think, is communication. Communicating the changes in the bill the bill makes will be key for the vast number of third sector organisations and the government must be prepared to take a full and active role in that. It cannot leave the already stretched sector to do it themselves. We heard evidence in committee and I'd like to thank everyone who gave evidence to us on this from counterparts across the UK of the importance of not underestimating the scale of communication needed and I hope that the government will take on board their advice from experience as it progresses. Clarity will be important too, particularly around the categories of people who can and can't be trustees or senior members of charity staff. Recruitment is tough and the committee heard that loud and clear. And we have heard in this chamber the same this afternoon. So whatever processes are put in place to ensure due diligence, which is crucial, also must be clear on processes to waive the, the, the obstruction to taking up those posts. For some people, being involved in charity work can turn their life around. That's why I'm keen to hear what specifically the government can do to ensure the impact of the rules on who can and can't be involved at those levels is proportionate, promoted and understood and doesn't undermine efforts to recruit or efforts on equality. 
Presiding officer, the committee heard that this bill is welcome, but that it is also largely Oscar's bill. They told us that the current regulatory landscape is broader than this and in some ways is cluttered, and that the government did not engage widely enough across the third sector to get this wider perspective early enough. For these reasons, I am pleased the government is committed to a wider review of charity law and regulation going forward. It is crucial that that review is independent, carried out with the third sector, and that they are supported to participate in it, not expected to carry out the engagement on their own. Because the sector really is struggling. They are still waiting for multi-year funding, and with it, the certainty and ability to plan for future years. Significant numbers of organisations fear they could close, and volunteers and staff are stretched. But regardless, they are still powering on and they are still acting as the last line of defence for the people of the state. Some cannot help. The sector needs that certainty of funding and they need to know that they will have the support and resources they need to engage in the implementation of this bill and the development of an independent review. In closing, presiding officer, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the sector, volunteers and staff again for all they do, including those in the Glasgow region, organisations like Partick Thistle Community Trust, whose invaluable impact on their community I have seen firsthand and praised in this chamber, like Healthy and Happy in Rutherglen, who support and encourage our community to flourish, like Glasgow Disability Alliance, who advocate tirelessly for the rights of disabled people, and like Grow 73, which brings Ruglonians together to make a positive impact on the environment and transform the local community whilst building friendship in the process. And of course, I want to pay tribute too to the work of SCVO, whose support and promotion of the sector enables it to develop and grow, and who never stops striving to push voluntary organisations to reach their full potential. I, I will. I'm very grateful to uh, my colleague for taking the intervention. She's, she's speaking about SCVO, and you know, I, I think it's crucial that in any process of uh, moving forward and looking at reform of the sector, the SCVO are, are, are a strong, strong partner and certainly take a leadership role in that because of their uh, extensive work in um, representing charities across Scotland of different size and scale. So would Pam Duncan Glassie agree with me that um, when the Cabinet Secretary brings forward um, a plan around the, the next stage of engaging with charities, SCVO very much need to be at the heart of that? I thank, I thank my, co my, my colleague and member for, um, for that intervention, and I wholeheartedly agree. And my hesitancy there was, was, was not to, to take the intervention at that point, but was to wonder whether um, I was uh, able to do so in the last seconds of my speech. So I thank um, the member for that uh, intervention. SCVO's support and promotion of the sector really does enable it to develop and grow and, and um, support people. They never stop striving to push voluntary organisations to reach their full potential. And so I do hope that they will be involved in that further review, as my colleague does too. Their work is invaluable, and we should do all that we can to support them and the rest of the sector. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms Duncan Glancy. Uh, and I call the final speaker in the open debate, uh, Fergus Ewing, a, a lavishly generous <laughs> six minutes, Mr Ewing. Um, you, you are so kind, uh, Presiding Officer. Thank you for that. And uh, as Pam Duncan Glancy so eloquently has said, we, we all of us owe a debt to those who, <clears throat> who give their time freely, generously, copiously to support charitable effort throughout the country. And indeed, Scotland would not be what it is without the effort of those individuals. Can I also just add my, my own thanks to, um, to Oscar, to the charity, to the people that work in Oscar. And I had the privilege of being the minister with oversight responsibility between 2011 and 16, and particularly enjoyed working with the very reverend Graeme Forbes, who, who chaired Oscar for, I think, um, eight years from 2011. Um, today's debate is about the regulation of charities. And regulation of charities is absolutely necessary. We've heard reasons for this. I think John Mason has made a number of telling points about this. Incidentally, John Mason was right, I think, to say that the audit limit should not be increased to a million pounds. I think he's absolutely spot on with that. Um, uh, but it is about regulation of charities, and we must be mindful when we create regulations in this place that we only do so when they're necessary, that they comply with certain overriding public policy objectives. And these are set out, actually, in the Regulatory Review Group, the Scottish Government's body that has policy responsibility for looking at regulation. And as I recall from, from memory, um, the, these are that regulations should be proportionate, they should not be unduly burdensome, and they should not result in excessive cost in terms of compliance, taking account the size, scale of charity, and so on and so forth. And these are sensible, desirable principles to which I think we should 
all comply and, and of which we should be mindful. Now, I want to talk about one particular regulatory impost, I think, which we really would do well to, to look again at. Um, before I, I come to that, recently, of course, the First Minister held a poverty summit in which he, well, he, he reaffirms the objective of uh, tackling, indeed eradicating poverty in Scotland, and that, that was welcome and heartfelt and ab absolutely paramount importance of what we're doing in this place. And I don't think many people, whatever party we're in, would demur from that point of view. And I think we also know that charities play an absolutely pivotal role in helping to alleviate poverty in a whole host of ways across Scotland. And this is something that, that uh, people are passionate about and motivates them as volunteers in charities. Uh, and perhaps the bulwark of that charitable effort, I think, presiding officer, lies in our churches. Our churches, certainly in my constituency, are behind a huge amount of the voluntary effort that goes on in trying to help people who most need help, whether it's Church of Scotland members whom I've met at food banks who volunteer for their time every week to go along to help out those people, whether it's simply organising coffee mornings, raffles, uh, events for the benefit of people who need that help most, whether it's the Salvation Army, whose work is truly magnificent in helping men that have perhaps lost their way in life. The churches are behind so many things. All of the churches, I'm not talking just about the Church of Scotland, which, which I remember, but all churches, all faiths. And across Scotland, this effort is, is terrific. Um, and there is one uh, piece of regulation, not in this bill, which I, I broadly welcome, but, uh, but in another piece of legislation which also regulates charities, presiding officer, which is the Register of Persons Holding a Controlled Interest in Land Regulations 2021. Now, these regulations were set up in, to pursue land reform policy objectives, principally that those landed estates held in trust or by limited companies are often secretive in the sense that people living in those parts of Scotland don't know who the owners are. And that creates a number of very practical problems. Uh, and I think that's the aim of the legislation, although I wasn't involved in it. But it was never intended that, for example, in the case of the Church of Scotland, who have 6,000 properties, that the names of every official in every congregation, in every church in Scotland, have to be entered on this register. Who, in what sense is there a public interest that this information requires to be disclosed? And moreover, Presumably, as office bearers change, as they do on a very, very frequent basis for all sorts of obvious reasons, uh, that register then has to be updated with a whole ream of information that nobody's interested in. It's not in the public interest, it's not required. And indeed, in this bill, in one of the sections of this bill, as the Cabinet Secretary pointed out at the beginning, there is, uh, rightly, uh, a duty to provide details of the trustees. And I think Mr Mason referred to that as well as the Cabinet Secretary. Yes, I'll certainly take an intervention. <laughs> Jeremy Balfour. Uh, I'm grateful for Member Trigg's intervention. Would you also agree with me that the people who are trustees for these properties, actually it is the congregation that control them. They are simply names on a piece of paper. They themselves cannot dispose of the property without the congregation's approval. Absol absolutely uh, spot on. Relevant point Mr Balfour makes, presiding officer. I entirely agree with that. Now, why am I mentioning this, presiding officer? Well, I'm mentioning it because of this, that at the moment, much of the money that churches raise goes to alleviate poverty. But the Church of Scotland, in a letter which I, I imagine other MSPs have received, and they sent us in January this year, uh, pointed out that having to provide all this information for 6,000 properties will involve them in legal and administration costs of hundreds of thousands of pounds. Now, where is that money coming from? Well, it's going to come from money that would otherwise continue to go to alleviate poverty and to help the poorest people in the country. Now, this has been raised with the Minister for, um, for Land Reform, who was Mary McCallan, I think now Marie Goujon's responsibility, and I appreciate the Cabinet Secretary does not have her own uh, responsibility for this matter, but I raise it because it is part of the overarching regulation of charities. It's not in this bill before us, but I think it does need to be looked at again. And I personally think that churches should be exempted because, you know, we're, we're not, there's no land reform interest whatsoever. Now, that could be done possibly by amendment of this bill or perhaps by, um, by secondary legislation is probably more appropriate.
But I do raise it, and I take this opportunity to raise it, presiding officer, and I raise it um, in doing so. Uh, sorry, sorry, I didn't see the member. Yes, Paul O'Kane. I'm, I'm very grateful to Fergus Ewing for taking an intervention, and I think he's uh, making a very important point, which is related, of course, uh, to the wider regulation of charities. And indeed, my inbox has been filled with uh, members of sessions from across churches in Scotland who are, who are very concerned by this. W would he recognise that there might be an opportunity, given the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland will meet uh, on the, from the 25th of May, for the Minister to perhaps re-engage uh, with the General Assembly and the General Trustees of the Church of Scotland to try and find some kind of uh, way forward? Fergus, you. I, I know the minister ha ministers have met with the church and made lots of efforts. Uh, thus far, they have ruled out um, exempting churches. I think that actually is justified. And I think the reasons for doing so, I am afraid, just do not stand up in water. Uh, I can understand ministers' reluctance to amend regulations that have only recently been passed. Uh, but nonetheless, I, I hope I have made the argument. And in closing, um, presiding officer, uh, having had this, uh, this lavish generosity uh, from your good self. In closing, if I have made the case so that members across the party, because it's not a political point in any way whatsoever, but if other members feel that I've made this point in a reasonable fashion today and that this is something which can be reopened, then as I try to do in many issues, I'd be very happy to work across party with other members to try to bring about a change which would achieve the First Minister's aim of helping in a small way to tackle poverty and continue to do so a small way, hundreds of thousands of pounds, can do a lot to help a few people. And uh, as they used to say, money a mickle, max a muckle. Thank you, Mr Ewing, for doing justice to my lavish generosity, which I now bestow upon uh, Paul O'Kane. to close for, again, a generous six minutes, Mr O'Kane. Uh, I'm very grateful, Deputy Presiding Officer, to you for indeed your lavish generosity, uh, and I will uh, attempt to uh, justify uh, that lavish generosity by uh, my closing speech. Uh, I, I think we've had uh, an important debate this afternoon in which we have heard, uh, I think, a, a broad uh, consensus here in the Parliament uh, for the general principles of this bill. Uh, as the Cabinet Secretary outlined in her opening, it is, of course, a technical bill. Um, and it is a bill I think we are agreed to in terms of trying to uh, tidy up the legislation, to make it stronger and to ensure that uh, the public have um, confidence in charities across Scotland and indeed to ensure that, there is, uh, that, that Scotland is in line with England, uh, Wales and Northern Ireland. Um, I think what we have heard uh, across the piece is that in the further stages of this bill there will be the requirement for refinement and for clarity on a number of points which uh, were raised by members uh, across the chamber today. Um, Colette Stevenson, in her new role as convener, to which uh, I, I welcome her, um, I, I think made important contributions on behalf of the committee, pointing out that actually um, the wider review uh, which the Cabinet Secretary has committed to will be important in terms of, of trying to uh, engage with um, the third sector on not just these issues, but also wider issues that they uh, have raised with the committee. I thought she made a, an excellent point in terms of we need to start that engagement early and ensure that the third sector uh, is approached from the very beginning. And I think uh, smaller charities being included in that. We've heard a lot today about the charities that uh, many members know from their own uh, parts of, of Scotland. And I think it's important that they have a strong voice uh, in everything that we do, because they are the people who make the change uh, in communities. Communities. Um, again, the, the importance of those charities was highlighted by uh, Jeremy Balfour in his opening speech, um, and I thought he made an excellent point about um, good governance being crucial, actually, to the functioning of charities. But, um, like many others, I think he highlighted that greater support is required, um, and I, I think stability of charities is required in order to make sure that they can, can meet their obligations and can continue to serve the communities uh, so well. In terms of charities serving communities and the particular challenges that I think exist for uh, charities, Douglas Lumsden's point about um, the, the challenge of recruiting trustees was important. I think particularly uh, his point about rural communities. Um, many members uh, across the chamber represent uh, rural communities, and we know that Charitable organisations in small towns and villages are very often the lifeblood of everything that goes on in those communities. They are often um, long-standing historical institutions as well. And it can be hard in a modern context to get people enthused to take on the roles of being a trustee, of dealing with the finance and operation 
of, of the charity and particularly in smaller communities. So I do think we have to have uh, our, our eyes open to that challenge and to make sure that we aren't putting unnecessary barriers in place for people who may want to become trustees. Because I think, as I said in my opening, it, it's about striking a balance. I think it's about having a balance between transparency and making sure that there is public confidence, but I think um, ensuring that we don't make uh, regulation over cumbersome and put people off uh, who may otherwise want to uh, become engaged. And I thought uh, John Mason, again, made uh, important points in, in this space, and indeed our exchange uh, in his intervention, I think, was important about trying to find that balance. Uh, I, I thought his um, points about interim and temporary trustees were important, because very often charities need perhaps a bit of bridging support, if you like, and there are people who maybe have professional expertise who are willing to do that but don't often feel that they have the confidence or the, uh, the, kind of, um, the legal uh, wherewithal to be able to do that. Um, I also think Mr Mason made an important point in terms of maybe the wider regulation of uh, charities in terms of reporting. Uh, I thought his point about charities under £25,000, you know, do we need to look again at how they report into Oscar and, and the level of scrutiny of their accounts? I think that's an important point. And I think hopefully in part of the wider uh, conversation we have, we can, we can look at some of those issues as well. Um, communication, presiding officer, was raised as an issue. I think both communication of the consultation. Um, I mentioned in my opening that um, many charities uh, felt unable to contribute to the, the committee's consultation because of the lack of um, uh, capacity. But Foyle Chowdhury, I think, rightly highlighted that many charities just weren't aware and hadn't actually heard um, that there was a consultation ongoing. So I do hope the government will reflect on that, uh, because Pam Duncan Glancy, um, I think, made an excellent point that communication of the changes um, when the bill eventually uh, clears its parliamentary process will be vital to make sure that everybody knows what is expected of them uh, and what they need to do. So I think communication is a key point that we need to uh, look at uh, as a parliament and indeed hopefully the government will want to reflect some of that uh, when they come back to the chamber. Um, as I have said, uh, presiding officer, the Scottish Labour Party supports the principles of the bill. I think we all want to see charities in Scotland that are uh, well governed, uh, are transparent, that people can have trust in. We want to make sure that when people um, donate to a charity, they do so uh, with confidence. We want to know that when they volunteer for a charity, they do that knowing that the charity is reputable. Uh, I think there are, of course, wider points that have been brought out in the debate which um, really talk about the health of the third sector in Scotland. Clearly, there are um, a multitude of challenges, not least um, recovery from the pandemic, the cost of living pressures, the demand for services, but also, I think, a, a longer-term lack of stra strategy to uh, fund and support charities, particularly things like three-year funding cycles, which we have talked about for a long time in this parliament uh, and, and haven't been delivered. So I do think we need to look at all of that in the round and make sure that we are supporting charities. And I actually thought Fergus Ewing's points about some of those wider issues that affect uh, faith-based charities and our churches. Uh, we can't get away from the fact that other pieces of uh, legislation are interacting here, and we need to take a, a look at that. And I think across the chamber, there is a cross-party concern about um, some of those uh, issues that he raised, and certainly very happy to have a further conversation with him, as I'm sure others are as well. So I, I think I am now going over the score, presiding officer, in terms of your generosity. Um, so I wouldn't want to fall foul of, of, of the chair. So uh, I think in, in concluding, I would say that I think there is a real willingness on behalf of certainly this side of the chamber uh, to work with the, the government to get this bill uh, right, to make sure that it does what it sets out to do, and to make sure that we take people with us in the, the charity sector across Scotland. And we look forward indeed to that wider piece of work that the Cabinet Secretary has committed to. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr O'Kane. I'm not sure you're entirely reading my body language, but nevertheless, uh, I now call Miles Briggs again, a generous seven minutes. But, thank you very much, uh, Deputy Pre Presiding Officer. And can I start by declaring interest as the Chair for the Heart of Scotland uh, Heart Research UK Appeal Board um, here in Scotland? And as others have done, can I thank our clerks and those who have given evidence to the committee as well? Um, but you know, very much to thank the charities and organisations across Scotland for the work that they do in our communities. And I think from outset, as we've heard from other members, nothing which uh, this bill brings, I hope, will impact on. That's something we really wanted to make sure, especially smaller 
charities um, across the country. And it is worth reflecting, I think, that my colleague Jeremy Balfour and I are the only two members who took evidence on this bill. Um, we are the only two original members of the committee. And, you know, Conservatives said we would be strong and stable, so we are definitely uh, demonstrating <laughs> that in this Parliament today. Um, but there's a number of issues I wanted to raise with regards uh, to the bill. And it is important because, let's face it, as other members have mentioned, Scottish charities have a combined income of over £15 billion in Scotland. They employ uh, 200,000 people. So it is important that they do operate in a regulatory framework which really safeguards that funding and these jobs as well. And looking towards uh, what we're doing uh, today and with this bill, charity law, um, which we are operating under, ha has been in place for 17 years. So it has been uh, necessary to modernise how this operates and to provide more transparency. I think none of us would agree, uh, disagree with that. And there's very sensible things uh, within the bill looking to allow for provision of information around trustees, updating law in relation to disqualification criteria, allowing the appointment of um, emergency charity trustees. That's an issue which... I pursued in committee and still want to see uh, more clarification on with regards to who these individuals will be, whether or not they'll be a Scotland-wide group of individuals. Um, I think we still need to have more clarification of that. We can seek that at stage two, but that's something um, which I still want to, to see Parliament and, and Ministers uh, pursue. Um, and as has been touched on previously and in the intervention to, to the Cabinet Secretary, I am concerned with regards to lifetime gifts and charity mergers. Um, I think in the future we will potentially see fewer charities, um, not necessarily because of this bill, but because of um, future changes and where direction of travel is. And, and part of my concern is we are seeing at this moment in time many people very generously giving uh, lifetime gifts in their wills. But what happens to these if a charity is merged? And I don't think necessarily inheritance law has been taken into account with this. It's something at stage two. Again, I'd like to see more clarification on um, from government because I, I think we need to make sure that is not something um, we, we particularly burden other charities with. And as a number of members have um, stated in this debate, that is very important. Um, Douglas Lumsden, Paul O'Kane and Faisal Chowdhury made this very point that this bill must not become overburdensome on charities, um, especially small charities who are just... Um, fully uh, volunteer-led. And I think that's something and a reason why many of these charities have not engaged in this process. They might not have been aware of it or they were, would not have the capacity uh, to actually input into um, the Parliament and the government's consultation. So I think that's something we need to, to take on board as well. And also with particular regard is where we look towards, um, the bill looked towards um, requiring charities to have a connection to Scotland. This is something I asked um, at committee around a definition of. I don't think we've necessarily worked out a charity which isn't registered as a charity in Scotland, but maybe a UK-wide um, charity just undertaking research, for example, in Scotland, uh, what impact that would have. And I, I, unintended consequences, and both John Mason and Fergus Ewing have pointed towards this, for, uh, is something we need to be very mindful of within this bill as it moves forward. And I do think actually John Mason made some interesting points, maybe not for this bill, um, but future consultations and reforms, because it did seem very unfair that a charity operating in Scotland with an income of less than £25,000, that could be a church hall um, anywhere in Scotland, is under the same regulation. And I do think that's something to look at. I don't know whether or not that is an income threshold, um, whether or not it is an employment um, threshold because there's obviously uh, different criteria and, and costs around administration but I do think that's something we haven't had an opportunity to input into this it's probably not something the government would uh, open up at stage two but it is something I think um, we need to be mindful of and whether or not we can have different criterias for that is something I, I was keen to pursue and, and hope there is a cross-party consensus maybe on on taking that forward uh, in the next parliament um, I believe the government did state that they might consult before the end of this Parliament on what that would look like. Um, so I think there's an opportunity there for, for us to do that. Um, in the, the final point I wanted to make was with regards to the recruitment of interim trustees. And, and as I've stated, I, I don't think necessarily, um, and, and I know the government's written to committee, we discussed this this morning, uh, 
around clarification of who these individuals would be. I think that's really important and the appeals process attached to that for, for individuals who might not be suitable. Um, so it is something I hope we have an opportunity to have further clarification at stage two, um, which is coming uh, very quickly um, down the line. Um, but finally, can I thank everyone who has contributed um, to this debate and also to the work of the committee. Um, if there's one thing which I think we have heard loud and clear as a committee, it is how charities um, want to actually make sure that every single penny they raise is going to the front line of the causes they are trying to um, advance in Scotland. And I certainly have been clear in, in our work on the committee that we didn't want this to be in any way burdensome on them. I take, in to, I take the point and have um, reached out to Church of Scotland as well with the points Fergus Hume raised. I think we need to look again at that and, and the registration. I know other charities have also um, made the point in terms of privacy uh, and charities who are operating in very different circumstances where that's fully understandable. So Scottish Conservatives will be supporting um, the bill as proposed at stage one. As the new convener, uh, Colette Stevenson, has stated, though, that is the support of the general principles of this bill. We now need to see ministers provide uh, detailed answers for the sector. And then collectively, I think this is a bill uh, which Parliament can approve going forward. Thank you. Thank you. And I call on Shirley Ann Somerville to wind up. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. And can I thank members from uh, across the Chamber for the uh, constructive spirit that today's debate has been um, carried out in, and I look forward to working um, with them as we work towards uh, Stage 2 and our further deliber deliberations. I'm also pleased to um, welcome Colette Stevenson to her new role as Committee Convener. I look forward uh, to working with her and, indeed, uh, the uh, experienced and also new members of the committee. I was going to say old there, and I thought, no. The, the experienced members of the committee and those that have just joined, but I have been ably supported my preparations for the debate today by my two junior ministers who were on the committee and did um, actually hear all the evidence um, in front of you. Um, today has been a really important uh, chance for all of us to reflect on the importance um, of charities and the important roles that trustees play. And I myself um, have been a trustee in the past. Um, uh, uh, ironically enough, given my uh, current portfolio, I used to be a trustee for um, Shelter, which they have uh, reminded me of uh, carefully since I've taken on my role in social justice. But certainly on my time, I absolutely did recognise the really important role that a trustee uh, can play in uh, a charity. And that's one of the reasons why this bill is so important. Yes, it's quite technical, and we've been through some of that today, but it is about ensuring that we've got the best possible conditions for the charity sector to thrive and to strengthen in our communities. The public support of charities is strong, public trust is strong, and we need to make sure that that continues. And it is very important that we reflect on the, the sheer um, um, breadth and depth of the charity sector that we have here in Scotland. Now, there's been a number of contributions um, today which are not uh, technically to do with what's in the bill, but very, very important. And they, I hope, can be some of the aspects, if people wish, that we want to take forward in the wider review um, of the framework for charities. This was very clear again during the consultations and the discussions uh, with stakeholders as well. They support the principles behind this bill, but they are keen for more to be done. And that's exactly why, as I said in my original um, remarks, um, that that we are committed to a wider review of charity regulation following the passage of that bill. The wider review, I think, can explore how regulation can help and improve the situation for all charities, but especially the smaller charities, which again have been mentioned by a number um, of contributors today, and they make up the majority, of course, of the Scottish charity sector. I'm also well aware of the pressures, particularly that the smaller charities um, are under, um, and their um, absolute determination to ensure that as we move forward with any wider review, we are working with the charity sector from the largest to the smallest charities to ensure that we are engaging with everyone as we move forward with this. We will take time to work with them to design uh, the, the, the review and what needs to be taken account in that. And I'm absolutely um, happy to confirm that organisations like SCVO, which have been mentioned today, um, will play an important role um, in that. Again, a number of members have mentioned uh, the very important 
aspect that we all have a responsibility to try and encourage, and that's about the diversity of experience on charity boards. That is very, very um, important. And that's particularly important for charities who want to ensure that those with lived experience are part of their trustee boards. Now, the aspects around automatic disqualification and the extension of that to match those in other parts of the UK is not designed to exclude those with lived experience from participation on charity boards. The measures are designed to address a comparative weakness in the regulatory system here in Scotland that could undermine public trust and confidence in the charity brand. The existing waiver system and its extension to the new criteria demonstrates that the law recognises there will be cases where a person who is disqualified can still and should still hold the trustee or senior management position. And it's important that we encourage uh, uh, charities to recognise that that is there and to take advantage of that should they wish to do so. Jeremy Balfour and others um, discussed the appointment of interim trustees. Now, that power to appoint interim trustees is a targeted power. It's very much intended to just be used in emergency measures to address situations where, for example, there are no trustees there to take decisions. It is a time-limited measure to safeguard charities and charitable assets and to get the charity back up and running. Now, in situations like that where there are no trustees about, um, a dispute mechanism, um, I, I would contend, is not necessary. But if Mr Balfour or other um, members um, believe that this is something that should be looked at, I would be, uh, of course, happy uh, to meet with members um, as we progress to stage two to see if anything more needs to be done on that. Charity trustees um, are, as many people have mentioned, uh, are responsible for managing money and property donated to the public in good faith. And that's why, as a result of current and proposed disqualification criteria, they're based on behaviours or conduct that government considers makes a person unsuitable to hold office as a charity trustee, and for this to be extended to those in senior management positions. Disqualification on the grounds of a specified offence or bankruptcy is time limited, and once that conviction is spent or the bankruptcy is discharged, that disqualification falls. In the interim, the individual can participate in the charity in alternative ways, for example, as a volunteer, or can apply to Oscar for a waiver. The challenges uh, that are uh, faced by smaller charities, um, I, I would like to spend a little bit more um, time on. Now, we do recognise that um, the concerns about the administrative burdens uh, that this um, bill would give to charities, and particularly to smaller charities, but I would say and try to reassure members on the fact that the main administrative change that will impact um, following from this is the provision of trustee information to Oscar. And this will take place um, using Oscar's existing online system that charities will be well familiar with. Um, and, of course, it will be something that will be done over time. So the development, the introduction, and the population of this internal schedule of charity trustees is likely to take place over two to three years, for example, and therefore charities will have significant time to prepare. But it is important, and I reassure members that we will continue uh, to work with charities um, as we go forward with this bill and in the implementation to ensure we are fully cognizant of any burdens um, that are being placed, but particularly on smaller charities. In relation to that, of course, um, I would say that it is anticipated that there will be two commencement regulations for this bill, one in spring 24 and one in summer 25. This will not only allow Oscar sufficient time to prepare and consult on the new guidance, but then, very importantly, and again this has been something raised by a number of members, to communicate this to charities and to ensure that they are well prepared for the changes. So, in conclusion, President Officer, I think the message from today's debate is therefore that there is broad agreement on the general principles of this bill. Yes, there is work to do, but I certainly hope uh, that we can work together on that as we move to stage two. And it is very important, I hope, also to send a clear signal out from the Chamber today about this Parliament's determination to support Scotland's charities. I do look forward to the bill progressing into the next stage, but I would end very importantly, once again, by thanking all those who work in our third sector for everything that they do day in, day out, to support communities not just across Scotland, but across the world. Thank you, President Officer.
Thank you. That concludes the debate on Charities Regulation and Administration Scotland Bill, Stage 1. It's time to move on to the next item of business, which is consideration of Motion 8683 on a financial resolution for the Charities Regulation and Administration Scotland Bill. And I invite Shirley Ann Somerville to move the motion. Cabinet Secretary. Moves, President Officer. Thank you. The question on this motion will be put at decision time. And I am minded to accept a motion without notice under Rule 11.2.4 of Standing Orders that decision time be brought forward to now. And I invite the Minister for Parliamentary Business to move the motion. Thank you, President Officer, and moved. Thank you. And the question is that decision time be brought forward to now. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. And the first question is that motion 8870 in the name of Shirley Ann Somerville on Charities Regulation and Administration Scotland Bill be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed. The final question is that motion 8683 in the name of Shona Robison on a financial resolution for the Charities Regulation and Administration Scotland Bill be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed. And that concludes decision time and I close this meeting.